Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third session of Wisconsin Trustee Training Week. I'm Jamie Machuk with the Nicolay Federated Library System in Green Bay. Also with me again is Jean Anderson from the South Central Library System. Thank you so much for joining us. We've had two great programs so far this week with uh, Marcy on Monday and Sally yesterday, and we're excited to continue today with Valerie J. Gross, who is the president and CEO of the Howard County Library System. Valerie has served as president and CEO of Howard County Library System since 2001. Developing a new vision for libraries, Valerie has worked with HCLS board, funders, elected officials, and the community to implement libraries equal education. She has developed over 60 keynotes, workshops, seminars, and webinars on the strategy drawing the participation and input of thousands of library professionals from 45 states and more than a dozen countries around the world. Combining these experiences, she authored Transforming Our Image, Building Our Brand, The Education Advantage in 2013. For living this game-changing vision, HCLS was recognized in 2013 as Library of the Year by Gale and Library Journal. So, Valerie, whenever you are ready. Thank you so much, Jamie. Hello, everyone. What an honor it is to be joining your week of presentations. I am just privileged to be amongst all of you from all over the great state of Wisconsin. This is going to be a fun, fast-paced session. wanted to let you know that while you are, of course, welcome to take notes, you will have the slides in a handout. Jamie posted that. So if you haven't had a chance to print it out yet, you will certainly have access to that. Imagine a time when everyone knows precisely what you do, a world where libraries receive the utmost respect, an age when we receive top funding priority in any economy. For a growing number of libraries, this best of all possible worlds is now. That's because they are adopting a new vision, which is the topic for today. This vision can be applied to any library type, and it's been developed over a decade by thousands of professionals, including trustees, just like you, and quite possibly you. So first, let's take a look at you. This is the beautiful state of Wisconsin. It's rich in history and natural beauty. I'm from the Midwest, so Goshen, Indiana, actually, to be specific. I know a little bit about the incomparable Midwest hospitality, and I know about Lake Michigan summers and certainly lake effect snow. So you're proud of all kinds of things in Wisconsin, including all of these famous people. There is Laura Ingalls Wilder and Frank Lloyd Wright, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention another famous figure that hails from Wisconsin. That would be Barbie from Willows, Wisconsin, the fictional city. You're also proud of all kinds of things, including the Badger, Harley Davidson, ginseng, and probably the greatest thing that you are known for is the dairy in Wisconsin. And the only thing better than eating Wisconsin's delicious cheese is wearing it. But you're most proud of your public Libraries. There's a sampling representation here on the screen. I want to thank all of you for your leadership because Wisconsin's libraries are leaders in this country. So thank you very, very much for all you do and you contribute. Today's topic will be new to some of you. Some of you are already incorporating some of this the approach that we'll be talking about. What we are talking about will further propel your trajectory forward and upward. The strategy, Libraries Equals Education, is a growing movement. It's ushering in a new era for libraries around the United States, in Canada, and indeed across the world. I had the privilege of presenting a whole series of seminars and workshops in the Czech Republic last year. They are looking to us, to you. They are following our lead. It's an approach that is incredibly simple and immensely powerful. And it's not really new. The vision that we're talking about 
actually takes us back to the original purpose of the public library. At the turn of the 20th century, this was before most public schools existed, public libraries were established as educational institutions for the common person, for equal opportunity for everyone. It's time to reclaim this purpose, but with a 21st century twist, because unlike at the turn of the 20th century, where only books were available, now, in addition to books, we have technology, and we learn through classes and community-centered experiences. So what are these libraries doing? Well, they are repositioning their libraries as a key component of the education enterprise alongside schools, colleges, and universities on equal footing with them. And it's like magic, really. No one asks them anymore with a puzzled look. Tell me again what you do. And the very best part about this is that implementing the strategy does not require changing anything you do. It requires only changing what we say. Externally, what this accomplishes is that the inherent value of library is never again questioned, and we receive maximized funding. Internally, we are suddenly recognizing that we have a crystal clear purpose. It makes our jobs more meaningful and fun, and it provides job security because we have a flourishing, timeless future. The concepts recognize that somehow over the years, our language has changed, and that it's our language that has created a disconnect. We know why we're essential, but many outside the profession do not. We don't always get the increases that we deserve in a good economy. And when the economy is down, we are cut more than we should be. We're treated like second class quite a bit. Well, we're first class. We're better than first class. And our language will correct this. So let's take a look at an example from the business world. I'm holding up here, and you're just going to have to believe me, a bottle of generic water. It's just a small bottle of water, and I bought six of these. How much do you think I paid for six bottles of generic water? Well, I paid $1.99. If any of you guessed correctly, um, that's probably um, just, just a generic water from any, any general grocery store. It's actually quite remarkable that they can sell water at all. Actually, in California right now, they would pay a lot more for even generic water. But generally speaking, I could get this out of the tap, right? $1.99. People are willing to pay that. Now I'm holding up a bottle of Avion water. Same size. Six of these. How much do you think I paid? I would say $5.99. That's quite close. Six dollars and fifty eight cents. Mm. And this was maybe well, eight nine years ago or so. And so it's probably even more now. But more than three times the amount. Actually at the time my son was uh, just starting high school. He was at the kitchen table, but nose buried in his biology book, and I came home with these and I said, Who buys this stuff? He didn't even look up, he said, You So why is it? that people are willing to spend nearly three times the amount for the very same product. It's not taste, although taste really does matter. I will tell you that in a blind taste test, I actually preferred the generic water that I had purchased over the, the, the Avion water. It's in part the language. Look what Avion does. What they have on their bottle, from the French Alps. Avion water starts as snow and rain on the peaks of the pristine French Alps. Protected deep in the heart of the mountains, each drop filters through layers of mineral-rich glacial sands for over 15 years. Ah, so I want to buy Avion. Oh, and it says detox with Avion. I want to detox. And my favorite, rejuvenation. So they use language to their advantage. There's also one more thing about Avion that I'd like to mention. And this notion is that Avion is cool. I want to be seen at the gym with Avion. I want to be associated with Avion. And I suggest to you that this poshness, if you will, is a good thing. We would like to be the Avion of public libraries, not just for funding, clearly, but also 
for just the the image, this concept. We want people to be proud to 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 have their library card and be associated to say they attended a class or an event at the library. And, and so the, the this notion that each of us wants quality for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. And so to be viewed as Avion is a good thing. So that's the goal, to be funded and viewed in the manner that Avion is. So the key to that, the secret, is to recognize that it's not just what we do and how we do it. And again, you all do that brilliantly. It's also how we talk about what we do that then commands the assigned value that we deserve. So in this webinar, we will take a look at the state of the library. We will take a look at some clever language the three components of the library's equals education strategy, and then in part two, how we view ourselves, some results, how to implement, and then what we can learn from the schools. So first, the state of the library. You have likely seen or heard of Modern Family. It's a comedy that has won all kinds of awards. Here is a family. Uh, the family is back in 2010. That's Claire and Phil on the right, the parents. On the left, Alex and Luke and Haley, and the parents call a meeting and they say, personal electronics have gotten way out of control. No internet, no texting, nothing, nothing electronic, no personal devices for one week. And the kids complain, they say, oh, and then um, Alex says, how am I gonna do my homework? I have a huge science paper due. Claire, the mother says, well, you can do your homework like I did. And in fact, uh, we, we have a set of encyclopedias somewhere. Then she comes up, Claire says, well, what do you think the public library is for? And then Haley looks up at her mom kind of above her eyes and she says, I thought that was the bathroom for homeless people. So everybody laughs and uh, we all think this is funny, but this is an example of how we really could use an image transformation. Peer research has conducted studies that almost one-third of Americans do not know what public libraries do. And I suggest to you that the other two-thirds probably don't know what we do either. What percent of schools would you say, what, what percent of Americans would know what schools do, would you say? I would say 90 to 100 <laughs> percent. I would say... 100% like you, Jamie. Yes. 100%. This is where this vision can take us. And for those of us who have already applied it, this is where, where we know it can take us. Back in July, uh, actually a year ago, this uh, Alan Pakgown Pal is an engineer. He cares enough about libraries. He's not in, uh, in libraries. He's not, uh, he's, he's someone outside the profession. He says, that we just need to get it together. We need a unifying message to survive. Well, that's precisely what we're talking about today. I actually sent him an email and he was very excited about where this might take us. So the state of the library. This is what happened during the recession. Libraries were cut disproportionately to other organizations, entities, etc. And it happened in 2009 in Fairfax, Virginia, in my corner here, 30% um, over two years. And the argument was libraries are essentially discretionary programs. Connecticut, libraries are not essential services. Now, notice that they don't view education that way, but they do not put libraries under education here, clearly. In Florida, 2013, do you remember this? This was uh, when we were already coming out of the recession. Florida, they proposed cutting half of Miami, Florida's libraries. That was something like 20 plus branches. Would they ever propose that about the, to, for, for the schools? Not, not in a million years. And the argument was, well, the age of the library is probably ending. Uh, we'll get back to this, but it's just um, just incredible that this is how our, the leadership in Miami-Dade, Florida would, would even propose this. Now, that's not what happened, but uh, I think they ended up cutting, trimming something like two branches. But the fact that it was proposed in the first place is, is simply uh, something that we can completely remove. 
And it doesn't stop. In September 2014, this was uh, from Ohio, again, uh, a Midwest state. A loss uh, since 2008, $105 million. And again, um, it happened a couple years back, and just in March, the proposal to eliminate IMLS. Just incredible. Uh, incredulous, really. Uh, would they ever propose to eliminate the U.S. Department of Education? So what has a typical response from the profession been to date for all of these disproportionate, ridiculous propositions? Well, we say, tell them your story. Tell them why libraries are essential. Tell them why libraries are important. Tell them. Well, do you see what the problem is with each of these? None of these is really bad or wrong. But each of these requires further explanation. It requires work. And each of these continues to keep us invisible. This was John Barry's piece in uh, June. If you haven't read this, you take a look at it. But this concept that our advocacy to date, all of the ways that we have presented ourselves, we continue, despite decades, to still be invisible. Well, back in 2001, here in Howard County, we got tired of constantly needing to explain why we are essential. We looked at the schools, we looked at the college and the universities here, and we said, look, they don't have to com continuously defend their very existence. We shouldn't have to do that. We do, like them. We are education. And so we came up with a smarter, simpler, no explanation needed solution that harnesses the power of language. And so let's take a look at the power of words. If I say to you, I'm going to give you a nutritious snack, what's your response? Are you first in line? I'd say an apple or banana. <laughs> apple or banana. <laughs> so you might look forward to it a little bit. If I told you now, I'm going to give you a delicious snack. Now what's your response? Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> well, Jamie, you're probably like most people. Now I will say, I can say this, I can poke fun because I used to live in Berkeley, California. If you are a sprout, a, a, a sprout cruncher, or you're talking to a group of sprout crunchers, you might want to use the word nutritious. But for most people, Jamie, like you and me, and I think probably most people in the audience today, delicious is going to be more attractive to you, and you're going to be just more excited about it. So that's, uh, that's the power of, of one example. Of How about this? Which do you value or support more, a used car or a certified pre-owned vehicle. Do you see what they did here? Used car, it shows, it actually conveys two, two things. One is previously owned, and the other one is dirty. Whereas certified pre-owned vehicle conveys pre-owned. So that is the, the purpose of, of the switch there in that industry. What about this one? What do you support more, drilling for oil or careful exploration of energy. Um, Jamie, what, what do you think of when I say drilling for oil? Texas. <laughs> Texas. How about the Beverly Hillbillies uh, with oil spewing from the ground in Texas? Do yeah, dirty. That? And, and someone, uh, someone just chatted dirty, and I would say the same thing. But careful exploration of energy, what do you think of? Solar panels, mm -hmm. electric cars, clean. Helping the environment. <laughs> yeah, but it includes drilling for oil. Mm -hmm. So we can be clever in our use of language this way as well. Words that completely changed an industry's image. What did the prune industry change its industry to? Um, this is two words to one. Actually, one word to two, coming to think of it. It was prune, and they changed it to dried plum. And that is because they wanted a hipper audience as opposed to a senior medicinal image. They wanted a more youthful, hip product. So now it's as hip to put a, dr a bag of dried plums in your shopping cart as it is a bag of dried apricots. Well, now take a look at two more industries 
that changed one single solitary word to completely revolutionize their image. The first one is the liquor industry. That conjures up images of winos, of brown paper bags, of addiction, right? And they changed it to spirits. Suddenly it is friends and sophistication that comes to mind. And the last example is gambling. What do you think of with gambling? Same thing as liquor, including pawn shops and uh, just, again, the, the, the low life and, and bankruptcy, things of that nature. Whereas gambling, they change that to gaming. Suddenly, it becomes a choice, a family vacation. So these are examples just, just to show you the power of language. Well, for us, we have also one single solitary word that can revolutionize our image. And that word is not Jody, but I give you Jody as an example because this is the first time that I tried this approach in public with, um, with, with where I was. So like many of you, I represent the library out in the community, and I, I serve on boards. And at this, in 2008, I was on leadership Howard County's board. So there were 25 movers and shakers in the room, bank presidents, uh, just really business people, right? So um, we were at a board retreat. Jody was sitting next to me, and we were charged with introducing each other as opposed to introducing ourselves. We had a set of questions. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite movie? One of them was, what does your organization do? Jody, we thought she knew what we did. She asked me the question, and I said, we deliver equal opportunity in education to literally everyone in Howard County. Jody's jaw dropped. She said, wow, I thought you were going to say you loan books. I said, oh, we do, seven million last year. That's part of the first pillar of our educational mission, self-directed education. It includes books, e-resources, anything our experts make available to you, the customer, to find on your own. Our second pillar, Research assistance and instruction includes personalized research assistance and classes we teach for infants through the oldest senior on any subject matter. And the third pillar, instructive and enlightening experiences, is the community center, the cultural center concepts. It's the author events. It's partnerships. It's bringing people together to discuss ideas. Jody was floored. She repeated that to the group. Uh, it was more effective than my saying that to the group. She, she actually repeated everything because it was succinct, and um, she, was, she was able to do that. So very, very effective. But I suggest to you that those 25 people, when they left for the day, had a higher regard for not just Howard County Library System, but also for Madison Public Library, for Brown Public Library, Brown County, for, for all of your library systems simply because of the language that I used. So our word is clearly the word education. That's our powerful word. The first thing to understand is what this vision is not. It is not we play an educational role. Neither is it we support education or we are an educational resource. I think most of us would say this. Do you see what this does? This is way too small. This implies that all we do is support the school's curriculum, which we do and we must because it is to our advantage, not just because K-12 through is a key customer base, but we can align ourselves with schools to our benefit. But this vision is way too small. The vision that I'm talking about is much, much more powerful. It is we are education. Education is our role. We are an educational institution on equal footing with the schools. Do you see the difference? The next piece that is critical to understand is the definition of education, because many of you, like must, must, much of the public right now, still associates education with just formal education. Education, in, additional, in addition to formal education, includes information about a subject matter, knowledge and activities that impart knowledge, the process of acquiring learning, 
acquiring knowledge and an enlightening experience. Now, I can't see your faces, but I was ecstatic when I looked at all of this for the first time back in 2002 and realized that absolutely everything we do in public libraries constitutes education. Everything. And education is indeed a lifetime endeavor. Now, don't tell the schools this, but we're actually more important than the schools because K through 12 is a short amount of a lifetime. Colleges and universities, a short amount of lifetime. Public libraries, an absolute lifetime uh, educational institution. So it's the development of the mind that is so crucial, the ability to think, to handle life's situations. That's the ultimate goal of education, and that is what we deliver over a lifetime. Also consider that education is a universal value. What is it that our elected officials say? Our highest priority is education. And at the federal level, even during the recession, we cut out things that we can afford to do without, but never education. We were cut substantially during the recession. Schools received six billion additional dollars during the recession. And that's money that we can get if we insinuate ourselves into where we are, where we should be viewed as, because that's what we are. Again, we don't change anything we do with this, because we already are. We simply now fully get the credit that we deserve. So we've looked at the library as an educational institution. There's a second piece to that. We need to position our library staff as educators. And then everything we do as three pillars, there they are. That's what I told Jody. Self-directed education, research assistance and instruction, and instructive enlightening experiences. Absolutely everything we do. In addition to describing everything we do under these three pillars as a succinct way to tell Jody and anybody else in a very clear, precise way that they truly see our value, there's a side benefit to this. Let's substitute for the next couple of slides the word schools where it says libraries. Are you ready? With the internet and ebooks, do we really need millions for schools? Are schools necessary or a waste of tax money? Farewell schools. Schools from now on will look smaller and less crowded. Can schools survive the ebook revolution? What will a school be useful for a decade from now? Schools will become less and less relevant. At some point, they'll perish. Do we really need schools? Schools everywhere are under threat. After all, who needs a school today when it's possible without getting out of bed, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? So do you see how speaking about everything we do under each of these three timeless pillars cuts them off at the pass? We will no longer see those types of headlines because when we speak about all that we do under these three timeless pillars. A century ago, we needed self-directed education, research assistance and instruction, and instructive and enlightening experiences. Today, we need this. A hundred years from now, we'll need this. Sure, we'll evolve, but it doesn't matter what happens to the book. I suggest to you that the printed book is around for, for centuries to come, uh, but it doesn't matter because self-directed education is timeless for, for any any time uh, that our society is, is in play. So here are some suggested phrases. We are a key component of Wisconsin's strong education system. And uh, the one I used for Jody, we deliver equal opportunity in education. Describe your staff, a team of educators, and support staff. And suddenly, you are speaking in terms that will attain for you avion levels of funding as opposed to generic. Just a comment about lifelong learning, because that's been one of our key pet phrases for decades, and we still remain invisible. That's because learning puts the emphasis on the student, whereas the word education gives the institution 
and the educators the credit. So as much as you can, exchange lifelong learning for lifelong education. And the best one is public education for all. There's this notion that elected officials don't say our highest priority is learning. They say our highest priority is education. Clearly, learning is the process and the outcome. But somehow, we have been not included in the education piece, and it's because of the language that we use. So, so simply consider that as you look at the language that you incorporate. So some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I get this. This makes sense. But what about all the reasons people come to libraries, including discovery and fun and play and curiosity? Well, never lose that, because these are the critical components and the most effective ways to deliver education. Play is not just for babies and toddlers and K through 5. It's for everyone. We all like it when it's fun and enjoyable. And so uh, just, just keep these terms, but do include words around them that are strong terminologies that are the avian words, and the strongest one is education. I'll give you an example now of how this was applied in the state of Maryland in 2008. It was the gubernatorial candidates. There, there were, uh, it was all across the state of Maryland, the, the, the candidates for governor. And so uh, I was on a legislative panel, and the Maryland Library Association president came with oh, some 10 questions for the candidates. And one of them was, where would you rate libraries in importance relative to other state services? Not a bad question, but the committee members looked at me and they said, Valerie, do you have any edits to this? Because they know I like to edit things. And I said, well, I think maybe we are missing an opportunity here. What if we started the question with a statement, a teaching moment, if you will, and then if we rephrased the question to use terminology that they had to use in their response, we could then quote them to our benefit. So this is how we changed it. I'd word it a little bit differently now, but it's not too bad. Public libraries are pillars of education. In your administration, how would you enhance public libraries, and how would you incorporate public libraries as you further the educational goals for the state? Well, unfortunately, we did not track the responses. However, two years later in Michigan, Doreen Hannon used the very same question in a candidate meet and greet. She had local, state, and federal uh, level elected officials, uh, candidates for, for offices. And it worked like magic. You can actually watch this. We'll give you um, the, there's, there's the link there. We'll give it to you afterwards, too. But they, they went around, and sure enough, they started out their responses with libraries are pillars of education. In my administration, I would, blah, blah, blah. Or libraries are the most important part of education. And uh, the strongest one, everything is on the table except Medicaid and education. And within that umbrella is public libraries. I would reverse any cuts to that. And so um, incredibly dramatic and powerful. Just, again, you just take a look at that because it, it, is, it, it will simply knock your socks off. So the third piece of libraries equals education is subscribing to a set of terms and phrases that are avion generating levels. It's, it's, it's words that people outside the profession understand. So we'll just take a look at a few of them here. The first one is story time. Back in 2006, we saw this in the newspaper. And you're sitting there thinking, well, what's wrong with this? That's the county executive, Jim Roby. He's in the library. You're getting some publicity. But we looked at the headline, and we said, oh, we can do better than this. Story time with county executive. Um, we had seen this, a similar picture, on the calendar of the school's calendar for that year. And, and we thought, well, that wouldn't have been this headline if it had been the school's. So we started looking at the word story time and asked, what does it mean? And in the workshops that I have uh, been privileged to present all over, we would discuss this term, and workshop participants concluded that story time conveys play, recreation, and babysitting. 
And in northern Michigan, one young lady raised her hand pale, and she said, it doesn't mean anything, nothing, was her response. And what she meant was that the term trivializes the value of both the content and her own expertise to teach the class. She, she was a, cheer, a children's librarian. So we saw this article not too long after that, a little song. You see there rattles being shaken over cute little babies. And uh, it was called Kinder Musik Classes. This is from the community college. We looked a little closer at this article and saw 45-minute weekly class, singing, vocal play, listening, instrument activities, interpret uh, interaction between students, develop social skills, teach the class. Oh, look, theme, milk and cookies. Well, we looked at this and said, oh, my goodness, this looks exactly like our story time, which we, we called um, – Play partners. And what are the differences between this class and what you probably call story time? Well, there are three. They call it a class. We call it story time. They say it's taught by a teacher or instructor. What do we say? It's really sad when you think about it. We say we do story time. I'm going to do story time. I don't know why, but that's what we say. And theirs, of course, costs money, and ours is your tax is well invested. It is not free, but it is free to the attendees. So then and there, we decided to start calling our story times children's classes. And we have, for instance, here in our source, which is our guide, our, our classes and events guide, our instructors teach social skills, listening comprehension, and the foundations of reading through letters, numbers, and vocabulary. Do you see how that goes from generic funding to Avion funding. Pretend you're the mayor or the county executive or the governor. What would you fund more? Story time or a children's class that teaches the foundations of reading? Similarly, a second favorite word is program. What does program mean to those outside the profession? Well, it's passive. It's computer-related, and the young lady in Michigan, this time she shook her head, as she, and she was laughing as she raised her hand. She said, nothing. And um, the community college, again, we can learn from them. Saw this article, Eclectic Collection of Classes. The first there, you can see beer appreciation. Found this in my mailbox, and there it was. Please bring a glass, not plastic, a bottle of water, crackers, and paper towels, $29. Intermediate genealogy, all these are classes, courses, English afternoon tea, creative gift wrapping, juggling, and my personal favorite, happy hair. That one is not even held on campus. It's held on a Sunday afternoon in a hair salon. Well, I'm not poking fun at the community college for holding these classes. Good for them. But my point is, we have classes just like this, but we call them programs. They say it's taught by a teacher, instructor, faculty, professor. We say programmers. They charge tuition, and ours is your tax is well invested. Well, then and there, we decided to strike the word program and call them instead classes, seminars, and workshops. And for the younger crowd, we say there you can see instructors teach subjects including math and science through children's literature. So again, do you see how with language alone, not changing anything we do, we go from Avion funding to the commanding the Avion funding simply, simply through language. A relative of the word program is programming. Unless it's computer-related, consider changing your phrases to our instructors are developing class content. Or if you're talking about classes and events, say classes and events. What does the word reference mean to the outside? If you look at this, you'll see that it means not at all what we think it means when we say the word. Well, there's another word that means precisely what we mean when we say reference, and that word is research, inquire into, attempt to find out, systematic investigation, a search for knowledge. And so consider eliminating the word reference and replacing it with research. Suddenly you'll command Avian funding. Now, this is perhaps the worst news for you today. 
the word information is one of the worst offenders and why we are more inclined to receive generic funding and strong, uh, big major cuts during the recession. It's because information is now ubiquitous. It's passive. It's directional. It includes where is the bathroom. People don't understand that when we say information, we really mean education. We really mean research. We really mean instruction. So when we can, in fact, there are many situations when you can't, you still have to use the word information. So, for instance, if I say to you, I've conducted this research on your behalf, here is the information that I found. You have to use that. But use the stronger terminology, and then people will certainly understand that we are an educational institution. Just a couple of others here. Circulation to the outside world means things that go around in circles. Health-related blood running through my circulation, the, cir the blood circulation. So consider customer service, borrowing, loan. Entertainment and recreation are very dangerous words. Those are going to receive the most cuts and the least increases. So use instead fun, enjoyable, uh, fiction DVDs instead of entertainment DVDs if you call them that. Information literacy is one of our favorite phrases. People don't understand that. What we really mean is that we teach expert research skills. Use that, suddenly you'll be receiving Avion funding. This is my own little personal pet peeve. Fill in, if you will, the, the, the second word. Juvenile delinquent. Was that your word? Yeah. So switch it to children's, the children's collection. And patrons, let me explain why, let me explain the order of, gen, uh, of Avion to generic. The Avion phrase is students of all ages. And you can use that by saying 5 million students of all ages participated in Wisconsin's summer reading clubs for all ages. Or 100 million visits to the library. Students of all ages visited 100 million times. So you can group people together like that. Customers is next because it advances our desire to deliver extraordinary customer service. Guests is next, next along with users and visitors because they do no harm. Patrons is last because patron, unlike customer, which is somebody who buys something with their taxes, a patron is someone who gives money. And if our premise is public education must be publicly funded, like schools, then patrons is sending a dangerous message that it's okay to expect private funding for operating budgets, for capital budgets. And that's part of the reason why the federal government continues to propose to eliminate IMLS. It's because they want to shift it to the private sector. So if we speak in terms of students of all ages and customers, it takes it away from this, this notion that private funding is, is okay because private funding should be for the frosting, for the frog statue, for the big extras, for a pilot initiative, for, for things that really shouldn't be used uh, for, for taxpayer money, but if it's, if, it's, if it's anything other than that, it should be publicly funded. Strategic titles. If I tell you I'm an instructor, what do you think I do? Teach. Anybody knows that. If I say I'm a librarian, what do you think I do if you're outside the profession? You think I sit around in books all day? You think I do this? Well, some suggested titles uh, to, to address this particular view of librarians. Why are libraries so expensive? It's such a simple idea. Get a cheap place where people can donate used books and volunteers, organize them. It could be done in an old building with folding tables and used bookshelves. And remember this in New Jersey, they wanted to to, to implement unlibraries with volunteers where people wrote down their numbers. Again, schools, you'd never, ever expect this. So here are just some titles for your consideration. Instructor and research specialist, research specialist and instructor, instructor, educator, teacher. If 
you want to keep librarian, at least talk about your librarians as their being instructor and research specialist. Use them interchangeably. Or you might want to do what Citrus in Citrus County in Florida has done. They call them instructor and research librarians. In Howard County, we simply use working titles. They are librarians, but we call them instructor and research specialists. And I can tell you, nobody asks them anymore what they do all day. Circulation clerks, about customer service specialist. They'll love it. Programmer, get rid of it unless it's computer related, instructor, facilitator, educator, teacher. And since there are trustees in the audience, consider that director is a middle management position in the academic and the business world. Similarly, city or county librarian, somehow that has remained over the years. You, you would never have a school leader called the city teacher. Neither would you ever have a president of a college be the director of the college. So consider switching to president and CEO. The board here in Howard County followed New York Public Library's lead uh, a number of years back. Since then, a lot of CEOs, president and CEOs, have, have, have evolved over the country. Be leaders in the, in the state of Wisconsin. It requires the board president to be first changed to board chair, then put CEO for your director and then add president and CEO after about a year when the community is used to the chair. But you will also be elevating the, the perceived value of the board because you wouldn't readily have a board president of a college or a board president of a hospital. You have the chair, and, and so you're, you're elevating your own perceived value. A teacher is anyone who is an expert in their field, and we certainly are. In private schools, you don't have to have a, a, a certification as a teacher. You can simply be an expert in your field. And colleges and universities, um, an expert. So that's, that's what we are as teachers. My last phrase uh, to give you an example of is the unremarkable phrase, programs and services. What does that mean? Well, programs, we already ascertained, is, is a nothing word. Service means performance of duties helpful to others. Chester County, Pennsylvania, pointed this out to me in 2010, that curriculum actually means all of this, including transformative experiences that take place in and outside of school. And at that juncture, we saw that everything we do can be called our curriculum. Curriculum is a word second in power only to the word education. Education and curriculum are words that are incredibly strong avian words. It's like green olives and dry white wine and sharp cheddar cheese. It's hard to say the first time. And you don't necessarily like it right away. But when you realize just how powerful they are at really taking credit for what we do, it is, it is incredible. So unless it's a fax service or a copier service or a service where you can perhaps um, reserve a meeting room, consider calling it part of your curriculum under each of these three pillars. I'll now just briefly touch on part two. This is how we view ourselves. We absolutely must cease and desist our pessimism and stop saying things like, we must remain relevant. If you were investing in the stock market, would you invest in a company whose sole purpose was to remain relevant? I suggest not. But any of these weak, pessimistic phrases, which we say about ourselves now, can be replaced with any of these we deliver high-quality public education for all. We design and deliver a world-class curriculum that comprises three pillars, self-directed education, research assistance and instruction, and instructive and enlightening experiences. Do you see how, then, you move from generic to avion? Some results. You will move from invisible to center stage. We took 10 years, but we finally got on the same page as the college and the school system in the tourism guide. Do you see all those pictures? Those are even ours. That's our new branch. But on this one page, we are part of world-class education with the school system and the community college. Our visits tripled over a decade, as did classes and class and event attendance. 
items borrowed, and most importantly, our operating budget doubled. In Indiana, stunned by the power of the E-word when he tried it in August 2014, got in, uh, the, the money he needed for a renovation. In Florida, just last month, Vicki Stever applied the approach. She used major component of Okaloosa Strong Education System, the three pillars, classes, workshops, events, mentioned partnerships with the schools. Not a single negative word or challenge was spoken, the first for me in the three years I've been addressing the commission, stunned by the power of this vision. Your neighbor applied this in 2014 in February, got an increase when all other jurisdictions continued to get dramatic funding cuts. Michigan used it, one of the earlier library systems to try this effectively in 2010, and a Virginia example developed a new partner because finally they understood the story time was really a children's class. And in Haiti, research department, gone is the reference department. Urban Libraries Council began acknowledging this in 2014 last year, and the ALA finally is starting to get on board. So with more library systems beginning to move this forward, we can then convince um, ALA that, that education is where we need to be. Brown County had the privilege of presenting to Brown County uh, not too long ago. Some examples from your website, Madison, Milwaukee, and uh, New Richmond's Community Library. You can see some examples here in Texas, Ohio, Virginia. Thank you notes. Instead of saying thank you for your tremendous support of, you might say library, you can say public education for all. Teaching opportunities. This is how you start to incorporate it. This is our annual report from last year. You can see it's a teaching opportunity. Signage is very effective. This used to be our information desk. This used to be our children's story, story room. Begin also by aligning yourselves with the already commonly understood definition of education, which is your school system. So strengthen the partnership with your schools. It's absolutely effective, and uh, K through 12 is a key component of your customer base. This is Battle of the Books. Oh, my PowerPoint stopped working. It's okay, we'll just hang tight. <laughs> Back up? Yes. This is Battle of the Books. This is just an example of an initiative that you can take on. In Howard County, we now have one-third of fifth graders participating in this reading competition where everybody reads 16 pre-selected books. I'm going to flip the, through these slides like a video for you. The students dream up team names and dress the part, and they have a 50-question exam on a Friday night. We give out best team name, best team spirit, best costume, and best score at all five venues now. That's our county executive. This is moving a library system from invisible to center stage like nothing else. If you'd like more details on this, I'm happy to give it to you. We'll have the uh, movie. There, I, have a, I have a video that you can watch about this, too, if you're interested. So in closing, consider a very short and succinct mission statement that it communicates very succinctly what you do. It could be as simple as we deliver high quality public education for all. And then you can, under objectives, include all the other pieces that you might wish. And one final example that we can learn from the schools. This used to be our pie chart. You'd say as a taxpayer, my goodness, you spend 79% on salaries and benefits. This is what I learned the school system does. Look. 44.5% on instruction, guess what that is? Salaries and benefits. Special education, 12.5%, guess what that is? Salaries and benefits, so we changed ours too. And now, 
your taxpayer and you say, wow, you spend 50% of your budget on instruction. What a great use and wise investment of my taxpayer money. So what if the world were to move from equal access to information to equal opportunity in education. Just imagine. Hope you'll consider joining this growing movement. It's uh, explained in detail in a book I've written, Transforming Our Image, Building Our Brand. Also, upcoming an article, look for it any day in the public libraries. It's a feature. And then there's an upcoming webinar and I've, uh, a PLA conference session in Denver on this. So if you're interested or want to send staff to it, I'll be doing that. So in closing, now that you know um, about this vision, you can articulate the why Wisconsin needs public libraries more than ever in six words or fewer. Are you ready? Six words. Equal opportunity in education for all. Four words. Public education for all. Two words, education, everyone. And one word, all together now, education. Thank you all so very, very much. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Oh, Jamie, we have two minutes. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> we, I'm we, happy we, to go over if people would like to stay. Yeah, we can go a few minutes over. That's no problem. Wow, I am just, um, yeah, it's going to take me a while to process all of this, Valerie. Uh, so much eye-opening information you gave us. Um, one thing I want to ask right off the bat, uh, someone asked, is your library's education logo, is that uh, like a copyright of your library system, or are other yeah. libraries able to use that? Absolutely. Please take it. Florida is a state that is looking at the statewide. If you read the public library's article, you'll see what they're doing with that, and it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's, do you see the website here, hclibrary.org? If you do three pillars, you can just go grab it. There, there are a couple of versions of it. There's one with more details. There's one with just a little bit. There's one that just says libraries equals education. It's also on my website, transformingourimage.com. It's also valeriegross.com or gross.org.com. You can get there anywhere. I've got it under the gallery so you can access it. But, yes, please take it, use it. And if you like the A-plus logo, that is available too. That one's Creative Commons, but the the, trans, the the three pillars image is simply available. So please take it, use it. It's it's incredibly powerful, and um, feel free. Great. Uh, before we get to the next question, uh, Linda, yes, uh, the slides are available. Um, Jean, if you could type in that website um, in the chat box, that would be great. Um, the copy of the slides as well as the recording, will also be available on the Wisconsin Trustee Training website um, later today. Thank you, Jean. Another question, uh, Valerie, can you suggest another name for volunteers or the volunteer coordinator? It depends on what you mean by volunteer. I mean, actually, I don't think that's a bad title. Personally, I don't know how, how the rest of you feel about that, but it seems to me that volunteer coordinator, if what that position is, is someone who actually coordinates, just like Battle of the Books, we need, oh, I'm going to say 300, 400 volunteers just for that night. So we have to get a whole host of people to come in and be judges and to give out the programs at, at, at five venues with 5,000 people. We need volunteers. It is, it, is, it is a volunteer coordinator who actually does that. And so we have a volunteer coordinator. Okay, great. Um, did you have any comments or pushback from the schools when you changed the language to education and curriculum? Our schools have embraced this, and that is because they are very much wanting their students and the parents to be encouraging the students to use all of the components of our curriculum and benefit from that after school, evenings, weekends, vacations, etc. And what happens is they use it more when the parents and the students understand that it's all, all a piece of their ongoing education. The piece to understand about this is that it is a slow evolution. It's not something that happens overnight. You start changing a word here and there. You introduce a concept. Maybe it is the CEO of the library system who starts speaking about something before the elected officials. Maybe it's an instructor who goes out, or, or, or it starts with an instructor who goes and, and is actually teaching a children's class and says, good morning, everyone. My name is Valerie. 
I'm your instructor today. Today, today's class will be focusing on the color yellow and the numbers three and six. You know, so it's it's an evolution. It's not something that is an immediate. And understand that all of this terminology, people outside the profession already understand it. It's it's us that we've we've been using terminology that people outside don't understand. So when you start calling a program a class, nobody's going to question it because that's what the people who are already coming know that it's a class. The people who aren't coming don't understand it. So you will get gain a whole new segment of population using your libraries because they will understand the value and you'll get more funding for it. Great. Uh, another um a statement came through. It's more of a comment. Maybe maybe you want to respond to this. Um, all of this sounds wonderful, but these days education is not doing so well in Wisconsin. And I'm guessing, Valerie, there's there's probably some of that um, in Maryland as well. Yes, and the response to that is is are the schools, colleges, and universities doing better or worse than the libraries? And the the concept there is why is it that the schools College, or why is it that education is not doing well? Is it because the perception is that the funding is not managed well? Typically that's the case, which is why this vision, I didn't really go into this, but it combines the best of the business and academic world. So in addition to using the academic terminology, to use terminology like effective, efficient, transparent, re, re, um, just the responsibility, the accountability, and, and really lead by example as to how public funding is invested. And, and it's imperative to, to always be speaking in those terms as well. Great. Um, final question. Has anyone ever suggested that education is often associated with accountability so that funders might require evidence of specific results, like schools being graded for their outcomes? We have ways to do that, and in some instances we can, well, for example, we all count statistics, but the way we have been able to get funding, for example, for Battle of the Books, I keep going to that, we need $25,000 just for the books, equal opportunity in education. Each of the 240 teams, 1,200 students, gets a complimentary set of 16 books. The way we convince our funders for that is we explain to them how reading expands not just the minds of the students with the subjects that they're reading and reading comprehension. It, it is teamwork and leadership, and it is critical to the success in all the subjects. The fact that a third of the students now participate, the fact we, we can get, we can, we can talk about the reluctant readers becoming avid readers, the avid readers going for the best score. The, the, it's, it's a huge impact and outreach and, and, and reach, rather, to, to, to probably 20,000 people. And those kinds of statements said with no doubt, it, it, we, we don't have grades, but we have the proof that it is an effective way to, 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 be, to be contributing to the education of these children. And, and it doesn't require a test score. If you use this terminology, it is strong and convincing. I think part of our issue is that we simply don't claim it. And to actually outright say, how can it not sometimes? How can it not is, 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 is occasionally a, a you know, like um, brain fuse or live homework help. I think a lot of Wisconsin libraries have this. To say it improves students' grades. How do we prove that? Well, how can it not? Very good. Thank you so much, Valerie, for a great presentation. Um, I wanted to remind all of you that tomorrow's session is with Gail Santi on library evaluations. That's up on your screen right now. Again, it'll be at 12 p.m. If you haven't registered, you can go to our website and do that. That's also on your screen, the WISTrusteetraining.com. If you want to watch the recording of today's presentation or of Monday or Tuesday's presentation, you just simply click the recording link, and that should be up later today. So, again, thank you, Valerie. Thank to all of you for participating and listening in. I hope you all have a great day, and I hope to see some of you here tomorrow as well. So long.